Good morning and welcome to the LPC Thinks webinar uh, with Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois' 17th Congressional District. Uh, I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Um, usually these are lunchtime events and we are around sandwiches with Congresswoman Bustos and others discussing the issues of the day. Uh, today we're all in a different place and we're on Zoom together. So welcome, I'm glad that you could join us. We will be recording the Zoom, it will be posted on Facebook and on our website. So feel free to share it uh, with friends and neighbors. We're now streaming live on Facebook. Um, Congressman Bustos is now in her fourth term in Congress. She's on the House Appropriations Committee and the House Agriculture Committee. She's the only member of the elected Democratic House leadership from the Midwest and Congresswoman Bustos serves on the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. And she's been a colleague, a friend. We've worked closely with Congresswoman Bustos over the years, uh, particularly Ann Mesnikoff, our federal legislative director, and I have as well. And we are thrilled to have Congresswoman join us today to discuss the recently released Climate Crisis Action Plan from the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and particularly the opportunities for rural America in the plan. Uh, we discussed it with Congressman Sean Caston a week or two ago. Uh, Congressman Bustos has announced the Green Rural Partnership, and it's a framework of principles and policies for rural America and climate action, which she also submitted to select committee. So this is gonna give us a slice in particular of what this means in terms of climate change solutions when it comes to rural America and how do you have rural America's voice and role in the solutions uh, to address climate change. Um, you're here to hear from Congressman Woman Bustos, not from me. So Congresswoman will present for a little while and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Uh, go to the chat box and you can submit some questions and we'll do the very best job so that everybody can be heard. So without much ado, let me introduce Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, a U.S. House member from the 17th Congressional District in Illinois. Thank you for all you do and thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Howard. And I will be the first to say we are here to listen to you as well. I, and I, you, you're, you have this nice soothing voice, but on top of that, you know your stuff. Um, so, Howard, thank you very much for, for hosting this, and I want to thank the entire Environmental Law and Policy Center for having me as your guest today. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a discussion in this short amount of time that we have on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, Congresswoman Kathy Castor out of Florida has done a remarkable job of leading that, um, and I'm sure you learned a lot from Sean Caston, who actually served on the Select Committee uh, when he was uh, your, your guest as well. Um, he's, a, he's a good ally and he knows his stuff inside and out because of his background in science. But um, so let, let's just start by talking about the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis Report um, and how many of those policies proposed will help put agriculture at the forefront of combating climate change. I want to do that because, as Howard said, I have served on the um, Ag Committee. Well, I've, I serve on the Appropriations Committee now. Um, this is my first term on appropriations. But I have served on the Ag Committee since I was first elected. The congressional district I serve, just for a little perspective, is 7,000 square miles. And those of you from Illinois, you're probably thinking, wow, I didn't know we had um, a Democrat in a committee uh, or in a, in, a, um, in a district that is that big because you know, most of the uh, members of Congress are in the Chicagoland area. Well, you get outside of that and our districts are kind of big. But, on top of the 7,000 square miles, we also have 9,600 family farms. And so um, that is why this has been something that I wanna make sure that I pay close attention to. So the Climate Crisis Action Plan calls for Congress, just a quick um, bullet points, uh, to grow our economy and put Americans back to work in clean energy jobs. Um, you know, we've got, we've got to make sure that we're looking out for the environment but if you, we've also got to make sure that we're looking out for the economy at the same time. And I think we can accomplish that, um, that we protect the health of all families. That actually should be number one on this list, that we make sure our communities and our growers and producers can withstand the impacts of climate change and that we protect America's land and waters for, for the next generation. 
And I know we're, we're all together on that. Um, so um, I, I told you a little bit about the congressional district I serve. It starts in central Illinois in Peoria, goes west of the Mississippi River, um, follows the Mississippi River all the way to the Wisconsin state line and then over to Winnebago County where Rockford is. Um, so it, as I mentioned, the 9,600 family farms in the congressional district, um, that is my family's background. I grew up in a, in a long line of family farmers. Um, I was not a farmer myself, but uh, that is my family's background. Um, so that is, that is what I bring to my role as a member of Congress. But I'm, I'm always, um, my professional background was I was a journalist. And, um, and then I worked in healthcare. But as a journalist, I, my comfort zone actually is doing more like what Howard is doing today, and that is asking the questions. Um, and, and listening. I, I like to say that God gave us two ears and, a, and, and one mouth and we should use those proportionately. Um, so what I do every year, now COVID is gonna change us a little bit, but I spend the entire month of August doing what we call the 21st Century Heartland Tour. And I drive from county to county and just listening to people. And um, so specific to, to agriculture, that is how I get a lot of our ideas. What I learned in our last 21st Century Heartland Tour is that these farmers have never seen anything like they are living through like right now um, as it pertains to weather. As I told you, the entire western border of our, of our state and the congressional district I serve is the Mississippi River. And then we have the Illinois River running through the southern part and the Rock River also obviously going into the Mississippi. So they, the, this flooding that we have seen in recent years has at, been absolutely devastating. And just the unpredictability of the weather um, and what that is doing to our farmers. And it's a wake up call for them. They are worried about their own future. So with the, the climate change um, impacting, um, obviously more than just the coasts, I think a lot of people just think of the coasts um, when when um, they think about climate change, we know differently because of, of where we're physically located here in the Midwest. But but we have communities all over this congressional district um, and others like it who are on the front line of this climate change war. So we need to make sure that rural America is part of both the conversation and the solution. And so that is why, as, as Howard alluded to, that we wrote out of my congressional office what we call the Rural Green Partnership. Um, what I saw in some of the other climate proposals um, was more that the fingers were pointed at us in, in more of these rural areas and especially in, in farmland and uh, in farm country. And so we wanted to make sure that the framework um, looked at how we can use and engage the heartland to combat climate change. And um, so that's what this Rural Green Partnership outlines. And we uh, submitted that as part of the select, select Committee on the Climate Crisis. So um, just, just a, a few things that I wanna, I wanna mention as part of this. Um, we submitted the full report to the Select Committee and they did a wonderful job of incorporating some of the key elements. Um, the, the main points of this is increasing agricultural resilience through climate stewardship, reducing agricultural emissions, increasing federal capacity to provide assistance to farmers and supporting renewable energy and energy efficiency on farms. So um, if I can, Howard, if I can just go into a couple details on this and then, and then we, can, we can engage a little bit, but. So oh, the rural, okay, the Rural Green Partnership calls for increasing funding for conservation programs and making more acres of land available for federal assistance. I think that's a very important component. We talk about strengthening our support for existing conservation programs, that we can incentivize the adoption and maintenance of conservation management farming practices and maximize soil carbon sequestration. There's got to be some incentive in that. Um, you know, I, I just think that's an, a very important part of it. Um, the Rural Green Partnership would incentivize the adoption of maintenance of precision agriculture right down the street. I'm calling you, I'm, I'm on this line right now in Moline, Illinois. So um, if you can see a little sunlight coming in, that is the Mississippi River right outside my window. River Drive is, is right on the other side of that. And if you keep going down the street, that is where all of the John Deere combines 
that are all over the world are made, right literally a mile down the road from where I'm calling you right now. So when we look at precision agriculture, places like John Deere have to be part of that equation as well. But the conservation management farming practices um, need to be partnered with increased funding and support. Uh, the framework also calls for incentives for integrated crop and livestock operations so we can maximize soil carbon sequestered uh, that are sequestered in cropland. And then the, the other uh, component of this is increasing federal capacity to help our farmers by expanding the number and availability of conservation experts who can advise our producers. You know, this is a learning process for, for a lot of our growers and producers. So that has to be part of it as well. Um, the experts are, are capable of offering customized one-on-one -on -one conservation assistance and can help our growers and our producers maximize the, the conservation practices. And then um, lastly, let me just uh, bring up maybe one other uh, pr uh, proposal as part of this, but, but expanding loans and grants that are available farm, for farmers and ranchers to improve energy efficiency and energy generation. So, um, you know, we're talking about innovative conservation farming practices, working to reduce agricultural emissions, and providing the tools that our farmers need in order to help combat climate change. Um, that is kind of what this whole thing is about. I hope that, I know that's pretty quick and a, and a lot thrown in there together, but that is, those are the, the key elements of the Rural Green Partnership that we have submitted to the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, many of which was adopted as part of their final, or, or their, their, not their final plan, but the, the plan that went public. So with that, um, happy to turn it back over to Howard and we can have a, as robust a discussion as anybody's willing to have here. Let's go for it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Right first of all, for what you're doing, and secondly, for the very helpful explanation of it. As a number of the people on the call know, the Environmental Law and Policy Center uh, was integrally involved in the creation of the Rural Energy for America program, which is one of the programs the Congresswoman described, uh, providing uh, grants and low interest loans for renewable energy development, solar, wind, and energy efficiency on family farms and ranches and rural small businesses. That program started in the 2000 Farm Bill. It's grown since and it's been a tremendous success. If you want to read a little more about it, take a look at farmenergy.org, www.farmenergy.org. A um, lot of questions, Congresswoman, um, uh, and I'll just try to pull some of them together. Okay. Um, uh, Harry Drucker uh, is interested to hear your views about carbon sequestration through regenerative agricultural practices. Um, how does the legislation you're proposing help encourage that? And what can we do to make it work better? Uh, Don Wilkin asks a similar question about uh, effectively incentivizing farmers to adopt regenerative farming practices. Well, it, it, you know, I, I think one of the major components that we have to make sure is, is part of this is that there is incentive for farmers to do this. Um, I mean, it's just not, we can't just wish this to happen, um, but it's everything from setting aside uh, the, the perimeter of, of farmland um, to making sure that there is incentive to do that. Um, for, for, let, let, me, let me give you um, an example, maybe that would be helpful. Illinois has some of the best geologic formations in the nation for storing captured carbon. Um, you know, which is, so, so we are uniquely positioned and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that carbon capture will be necessary to get where we need to be. So, um, so, so, you know, we need to make sure that we're providing the resources necessary to rural communities to help them in this fight. And we should invest in things like technical assistance and financial incentives. Um, it, and those are just a, a couple of the ideas that, that are in there. Um, but, you know, we are, we're in a good place for this. And, uh, but it's going to take partnerships and it's going to, to take um, research. We've got, I think the other thing worth noting as far as carbon capture, we have the largest agricultural research center um, through the USDA mm. right here in our congressional district um, in, in Peoria, Illinois. Um, 
not to get overly political here, but the Trump administration has been devastating uh, to agricultural research, actually wanting to defund um, so much of it and not fill open positions. But we can use that U.S. Department of Agricultural Research Center, the largest in the nation, um, right here out of Peoria, Illinois, as, as, as a way to dig deeper into the technical assistance and the research that can be helpful to us as we move forward. Uh, Congresswoman, there are a number of questions about just how does COVID-19 affect farm workers in your district? How does it affect some of the renewable energy goals you've described? You know, how does it make a difference in, in the same way? How do the tariffs uh, on China that the Trump administration has proposed? Uh, how does that affect the equation here? Well, first of all, um, some of the worst outbreaks in the entire nation and certainly in, in this part of the country have been at the, the, at the meat packing plants. Um, in our congressional district, we have um, two very large meat packing plants, one in, in Monmouth, Illinois, one in Joslin, Illinois. Um, one is beef and one is pork. And um, they had to go all the way from being shut down to kind of this slow reopening with major investments in uh, distancing the, the workers. But there have been, you know, just terrible cases of, of this that have, have impacted them. Not to mention things like, you know, where we have, we have an egg farm in, in Pearl City where most of the workers there are, it's, it's immigrant labor. And um, so th there has been a very large impact on, on uh, that COVID has played into, you know, getting the, the finished product to, to market. Um, I think the other thing that is we're going to learn from is, you know, if you look at agriculture, so much of that has gone to the restaurant industry. And um, with so many restaurants still being uh, closed or operating at partial capacity, um, we've got to look at even the, the food distribution network and how we're going to adapt to that. So um, I think there will just there will have to be a lot of changes that will come out of this um, as it pertains to um, immigration status. And, and again, the Trump administration has been absolutely, um, frankly, heartless toward um, people who have uh, come to our country or want to just succeed in our country. And um, what was the second part of your question, Howard, the, the COVID-19 impact on, on ag, and you had a, a second part of that. And then there were some questions about how did tariffs play in that as well? Oh, tariffs. Um, well, you know, again, we've, we've been in this constant, unpredictable place as it pertains to agricultural trade. Um, and, and now with new tensions that have, um, have come forth because of our uh, fighting with, with uh, China, um, there's more unpredictability. But I, I think the long and short of it is we can't go this alone. Um, you know, we've got to have our, our, our partners in this. And, and uh, the Trump administration has just chosen to kind of go it alone as it pertains to, to trade. So um, just, really just so much unpredictability, Howard. This, but I guess the long and short of it is COVID has been really tough on the agricultural sector. And uh, the Trump administration has been very tough as it pertains to rather than opening new markets, uh, so many have been shut off. As you know, transportation is now becoming the largest sector when it comes to climate change problems and pollution. Um, a question from my former colleague, Ellen Partridge. And Ellen and I have talked about this a lot. The environmental community tends to focus on transportation measures in urban and suburban areas, but there's a lot of need and opportunity in rural communities. Uh, how do you see rural transportation faring in like the Moving Forward Act and uh, other ways of making more efficient rural transportation uh, as a climate change solution, as part of it? Well, um, I th I'm going to look at this maybe in a somewhat of a different way than. Um, than just getting uh, from from one town to the next, but more how do we how do we do this um, in a way that's respectful of the climate? And I think a big part of that is our locks and dam system. Um, you think about you, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, and Howard, you might, but how many trucks are taken off the road when you look at moving goods um, through our locks and dam system? And as you probably all know, this is a system that was built in the Depression era and is crumbling and needs major investment. 
the congressional district that, that I serve has one of the most numbers of locks and dams than any congressional district in the country, again, because the western border of this district being the Mississippi, the western border of our entire state being the Mississippi. Um, so that, that is a way where we can move so many of our agricultural products in a way that is very respectful of the environment. But it takes investing in that, um, including our uh, the, the NEST program, which has been something that we've been a, a very big advocate for. Um, on top of that, and again, this is maybe a little bit of a different way to look at it, but rural broadband is going to be critical for um, actually doing so much that can take uh, vehicles off the road. We, I mean, one, one of the things that we're learning during this, this COVID-19 crisis is telehealth is something that um, is critical to, to rural America because, because we don't have the number of, of health clinics. We don't have the, I mean, we've, we've seen hospitals actually close down, birthing centers actually close down. Um, people who aren't able uh, to, to get to the clinics, for instance, because um, because they need treatment at home. Uh, what that is going to take is investment in broadband. We have 23 million rural Americans that don't have access to high-speed internet. And um, so that is part of the, actually our infrastructure package that we as House Democrats have put together that it shows also respect to, uh, to the environment. So again, that's maybe a little, taking a little bit of a different approach to it, but those are the kind of things that I look at from the congressional district, like the one that I serve in. Congresswoman, the answer on your trucks question is, it takes lots and lots of trucks and diesel pollution <laughs> off the road, depending on what study you've lots made. And lots, lots, yeah. lots and lots, and rural <laughs> broadband, absolutely, for all the reasons you're saying. Um, I know we have just about three, four minutes, and I'm gonna try to pull together a couple of questions people have, and then you should close uh, okay. with anything you'd like to add. A lot of questions about um, mobility and passenger rail. Are we finally going to get good quad cities to Chicago passenger rail really up and running? Um, a number of questions about uh, incentives for floodplain restoration and carbon soil sequestration, not just deep sequestration, but using the soil through regenerative ag practices. Do you, do you want to comment on any of those? Yes, yes, no, I, I would love to. Um, so let's start with um, uh, uh, trains. Um, you know, look, we as a nation need to set that as a goal to have, um, uh, to have high speed rail as part of our long-term strategy. But specific to this area in the, in the Quad Cities was mentioned, um, we have ongoing negotiations. Um, it, very much got stalled um, under the Rauner administration when, believe it or not, we had this federal funding all lined up and um, Governor Rauner was not willing to accept that federal money um, and delayed it until we got right down to a deadline. Uh, we were able to, <laughs> I, I guess I'll say, put pressure on him to accept that. We have uh, worked hard legislatively to expand the length of time so we can continue to work on uh, making sure everything is in place for that uh, the service from Chicago to the Quad Cities. We also now, through uh, Governor Pritzker, we have on the books also to get rail from Chicago to Rockford. And uh, now that is much farther down the line, but, um, but that is something that is also on the books at this point. Um, so we feel good that that will happen. It's not going to happen in 2020. It's probably not going to be up and operational, maybe even in 2021, but it will be up and operational in the coming years. Um, you know, this is something I've lived in the Quad Cities for 35 years now, and this is something that we've been talking about. I can't even tell you how long, um, but, but it will happen. Uh, carbon sequestration um, in the soil, absolutely. Um, that is part of um, what we have in our Rural Green Partnership. Um, for, for those on this call, if you don't have a copy of our Rural Green Partnership, we'll make sure that Howard, I think Howard has that, and um, we can just give you a link to all of the, you know, the proposal itself. We can give you a link to the highlights. I'll make sure that our staff has that in there. But um, the, the, uh, a guy in our office named Matt Bright had his PhD, and I don't know exactly the title, but it's like soil conservation. 
And um, he was really the, the leader in our office putting that together. So I can tell you that, uh, that carbon sequestration is a, a very important part of this. Um, and we wanna make sure that that in, you know, any kind of end legislation that we have that in consideration. I, in, in, in the hats off to Howard and the Environmental Law and Policy Center for helping us with that. Before we put it all together, they were advisors for us on making sure that we had some key components in our final Rural Green Partnership. Um, and I guess uh, just for the sake of time, uh, to make sure that I'm, I, I like to start on time and end on time, I think the one other thing that I wanna do a shout out for is uh, we have another piece of legislation that I think plays into what we are, uh, what we're talking about tonight, but it's called the Social Determinants Accelerator Act. Um, and for, for those who have followed issues like this, it's basically looking at social determinants of health and how, in, how the environment plays into our health. And um, we, we got this included as part of um, our final appropriations bill. And it calls for having $1 million grants in, uh, for, for communities that um, want to put together a, a deeper look at the social determinants and how, in that, is, how that is playing into people's health. So um, we can also make sure that Howard has uh, the, the details of that and can get that out to everybody. But we, it, uh, let me just close by saying, um, I like input, I like ideas. Uh, please, we are a phone call away in our office. Please share any thoughts that you may have that can help us um, with anything legislatively that might be helpful to not just uh, the state of Illinois, but the entire Midwest and our entire nation. We always welcome your input. And with that, Howard, thank you very much for the opportunity. We're, we're grateful to you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Congressman Bussos, for joining us today, but more importantly, for all you do to help make a difference. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we posted in the chat box the web link to the Rural Green Partnership. A lot of good things in there, a lot of good information. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with you, Congresswoman, to make things happen and get things done, especially in rural America when it comes to climate change. So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this will be posted on Facebook. It's live. And it will also be on the LPC website. Um, more information to follow. So thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, everybody.